work, a job on the land, seems to take a back seat. This is also reflected by his position at the table. It's the two women in the foreground who run the home. However, the picture relies less on color for its effect than on the contrasts of light and shade, reminding us again of Dutch Chandra painting, with which the Lenin brothers would have been familiar, since Paris in the early 17th century had a colony of Flemish and Dutch artists who exhibited each February at the Saint-Germain Fair. The brothers would certainly have visited this and been greatly influenced by what they saw. The mother's importance in this family group is subtly stressed by the amount of space around her. And what a tender portrait of this young boy playing a flute. His face, like his sister's beyond, is lit up and innocent. These two children, in fact, form an effective compositional link between the parents, and they mirror deeper psychological truths. A life of poverty and hard work are all too apparent from these careworn features. This haunting image betrays a grim determination in the face of such a life. But in spite of a life of hardships, the mood of this painting is surely one of hope, as expressed by the natural appeal of the children. Even the fire glowing in the corner and the family's only source of heat can be read as a symbol for the flame of youth. The striking contrast between each child's youthfulness and their parents' age not only conveys a sense of life's transitoriness, but must offer a glimmer of hope for the future. Hope that one day these children will see a better life than their parents have had. What is important is that although this peasant family reflects an age past, Lenin's supreme achievement, both compositionally and psychologically, is in bringing home these universal human truths. Truths that are as relevant today as they were over 200 years ago. The value of art in the service of the state was recognized by the leaders of the French Revolution, who set about developing the Louvre as a national museum. The process was carried a stage further by Napoleon, who sought to enhance the prestige of his imperial regime by bringing to Paris many of the great masterpieces of classical and Renaissance art. During the 17th and 18th centuries, Collections had been amassed by French aristocrats from the increasingly impoverished Italian noblemen, churches and monasteries. Napoleon's trophies of war, looted from the palaces and public buildings of Europe, gave the Louvre the status of a world museum. But the transformation was only temporary, for with Napoleon's downfall in 1815, the majority of these works were repatriated. In 1796, the French painter Hubert Robert painted this imaginary view of what he planned for the great gallery of the Louvre. Robert was made keeper of pictures at the Louvre and charged with creating a true museum of the people. Since the king's removal to Versailles, the galleries had remained empty and much work needed to be done. He used his own gift as a painter to depict many a vision of such an ideal museum. This view of the Louvre Gallery dates from 1798 to 99. In this painting, Robert shows the corridor, which was built at the end of the 16th century, linking the Louvre to the Tuileries as an airy, light-filled space with a glass and iron roof. The pictures are shown in the type of dense hang, cramped together row upon row, which was fashionable throughout the 18th and early 19th centuries, interspersed with works of sculpture. The paintings represented include many well-known masterpieces, among them a holy family by Raphael. The copyist working assiduously in front of it may well be the artist himself. Raphael was then regarded as the supreme exemplar of Renaissance art, in the same way that the Apollo Belvedere in the Vatican represented the pinnacle of classical art. In a striking second painting of the Grand Gallery, painted in the same year as the first, 
Robert imagines it as a ruin, in the spirit of the fallen buildings of antiquity, which he loved to paint. In front of a group of colossal columns in the Grand Gallery, an artist is sketching the Apollo Belvedere. There are other famous statues to be seen, amongst them one of Michelangelo's slaves. This statue was actually on view in the Louvre at the time. The Apollo came to the museum later, thanks to Napoleon's depredations. But its stay there was short-lived. It was subsequently returned to Italy, along with many others. The message of this picture seems clear. Buildings and works of art may decay, civilizations fall, but art and beauty remain eternal. These statues embody an aesthetic truth that is timeless and cannot be destroyed. Of all the statues of antiquity, it was the Belvedere Apollo which was most revered, was indeed an object of supreme idolatry. This statue was found at the end of the 15th century. It's a marble copy from the Roman period of a Greek bronze, cast about 340 BC, and is thought to be the work of the sculptor Leocares. It was named the Belvedere Apollo after the place in which it was kept in the Vatican. Winkelmann, the famous 18th century German art historian and archaeologist, said that of all the works of antiquity to have escaped destruction, this figure represented the highest artistic ideal. Today, the reputation of the statue has declined, and it has lost much of its appeal. But in Robert's day, it was regarded as the supreme embodiment of human beauty, symmetry and grace, and the most worthy of emulation. The painting operates on a number of levels. It conveys the artist's feelings about the nature of Greek art, that it is indestructible. It plays to the sublime and romantic feelings aroused by picturesque and magnificent ruins. And it underscores the certainty that there is an aesthetic and moral value in collecting works of art. These ideas, as expressed by Robert, represented current aesthetic attitudes towards art. The French Revolution exercised a liberating effect on culture as on politics. Art was to be made available to a wider public. It would be accumulated in museums as a model for inspiration. Taste, on the other hand, remained bound by the conventions of classical and Renaissance art. Only a few connoisseurs appreciated the aesthetics of Gothic art and primitive forms of expression were largely disregarded. It's difficult to understand now what a pervasive influence the classical canon exercised for several centuries. It was only under the successive onslaughts of romantic, realist and impressionist art in the 19th century that a more liberated aesthetic climate was gradually created. And the battle continued to be waged by the modernists well into our own century. But for Hubert Robert, the classical view of art was both natural and compelling. It was during the 12 years he spent studying and working in Italy, when he was greatly influenced by the architectural perspective in the works of Panini, that he first came across this concept and saw the truth of it confirmed. When he was almost 60, Robert devoted himself to preserving this world of art in a museum environment. Robert also painted what the Louvre Gallery actually looked like. The picture, which dates from 1795, clearly shows just how much the Louvre differed from his ideal. This picture is a document, but at the same time it continues the 17th century genre tradition of gallery interiors. This type of painting depicts the connoisseur or admirer of art in rooms hung thick with paintings. Quantity is more important than quality. This characterization of art as an aesthetic status symbol as having a commercial value, was documented by the Italian painter Panini. But the accumulation of art in such a self-glorifying fashion was utterly alien to Robert. For him, the art itself was the real subject. He shows how the addition to a gallery of great works of art can be of a real and important value, even though they've been removed from the churches and castles that originally housed them, and which gave them function and meaning. In his painting, 
he pithily sums up the theory of art in his day. The art of antiquity and the Renaissance, now collected in museums, conveys a sense of order and certain knowledge by its very appearance. Order because from a formal point of view, this art is definitive and unchanging. Certain knowledge because confirmation of its status is furnished by the academies and their artists. Religious wars, epitomizing the bad old times of disunity, have been replaced by the great religion of culture which is a unifying force, and its temple is the museum itself. The French Revolution, a time of subversive thought and subversive action, and so the gateway to a new world age, began in aesthetics as an age that wanted to understand the art of a bygone era. It began as historicism. But modern art evolved during the 19th century in direct and hostile opposition to academic art. The theory of art that inspired Hubert Robert's paintings was rejected by this later anti-academic form of art. What remains from Robert's pictures is the material illustrating his theory, a wealth of diverse and artistically convincing views of the great gallery of the Louvre. For him, this gallery was certainly much more than a tempting conveyor belt to propel hordes of tourists at great speed past thousands of masterworks. Among the many works of art which Napoleon brought from all over Europe to the Louvre in Paris, was a large altarpiece by the early Renaissance painter Andrea Mantegna. Only the original central scene of the predella, which formed the base of the altarpiece, remains in the museum's collection. The subject of this comparatively small wooden panel is the crucifixion. Despite its modest size, it's one of the grandest crucifixions in Italian art. Mantegna, who was born near Padua, painted it between 1456 and 1459, when he was in his mid-twenties. The cross, which bears the dead Christ, forms the central axis of the painting. It stands in a splintered, rocky landscape, surrounded by groups of figures, which appear to have also been turned to stone by the tragic impact of the event. Here, in the center ground of the painting, witnesses returning from the spectacle are climbing the steep road which curves towards the city of Jerusalem, towering on its nearby hill, overshadowed by a giant crag. The rocky platform in the foreground is deeply incised with grass-grown crevices, holes into which posts can be driven and a litter of human bones identify this gruesome spot as a place of execution, Golgotha, place of a skull. To the right hangs the tortured body of the unredeemed thief, in front of a naked rock face on which all vegetation has withered. At the foot of this cross, callously indifferent to what has taken place, the remainder of the execution party are casting lots for Christ's robe. Juxtaposed to the soldiers and pulled back from the cross of Christ, a group of weeping women are huddled around the figure of Mary, who has collapsed in the arms of two of them. Here, with an expression which contrasts the agonized grimace of the other condemned man, hangs the redeemed thief in front of the crowded city of Jerusalem. He seems to indicate the promise of ultimate redemption for all true believers. Beneath this cross, the anguished figure of John gazes at the dead Christ. His gesture of desperation is made all the more expressive by its restraint. The central crucifix stands in isolation the body of Christ fully silhouetted against the sky. It divides the painting in terms of theme and composition. The left-hand side depicts life in all its pain and ultimate joy, and the right, a world which has fallen into corruption, indifference, war, and death. At the same time, the cross unites these tragically contrasting aspects and stands there as a universal symbol, eternal as the rocks. 
The colors of the painting have an enameled brilliance. The desolation of the scene is intensified by a bright, clear light, uncompromisingly exposing each minute detail, held together by a tight linear web of calculated composition. If we follow the eyes of John the Baptist, the rider with his back to us on the right, and the soldier behind the group of women, they intersect at the point where the cross piece meets the upright of the cross. Their gaze is fixed on the face of Christ. Looking from the right-hand corner of the painting, however, the position of the horses, one behind the other, and the deep clefts in the rock, help to create an effect of steep perspective, leading the eye back towards the city of Jerusalem. Yet the focal point of the painting is neither centered on the face of Christ, nor is it in the background. The center stage is right at the front. It is delineated by the arrangement of the three crosses, that of Christ making its rear boundary and the crosses of the thieves its side walls. The platform of rock is cut into steps at the front, forming a partly hidden foreground from which two soldiers emerge, cut by the frame. In Mantegna's masterly composition, this space is surrounded and defined by the complex groups of figures, but it remains tellingly empty. Viewed on its own, the painting is tremendously impressive, but it should also be seen in the context of the complete altarpiece. The other two panels, which make up the predella, depicting Christ and the sleeping disciples on the Mount of Olives, set in the same landscape of red rocks, and the resurrection, share the dramatic and poetic expression of the crucifixion. The large picture of the altarpiece is, however, strictly classical and objective in its treatment. It is composed of three panels separated by columns, which form one side of a square loggia. Enthroned in the center of this richly decorated, ideal classical temple are the Madonna and Child. They are surrounded by putti, singing and strumming on lutes, whilst saints from various ages are assembled in the side panels. The spatial concept of the three crosses in the predella echoes the arrangement of these three panels. The empty stage formed by the crosses is in marked contrast to the crowded stage of this stately and festive scene with its holy group. Mantegna was one of the first artists to establish this theme of the Sacra Conversazione, a composition of Madonna and Child surrounded by saints and angels in the painting of Northern Italy. Here we see the complete altarpiece. It was commissioned by Gregorio Carrera, abbot of San Zeno in Verona in 1456, and was installed in the church three years later. Napoleon had the altarpiece taken to the Louvre in 1797, and when it was returned to Verona by the commission of 1815, the three predella panels remained in France, the crucifixion in possession of the Louvre and the others at the Museum of Tours. They were replaced in the church of San Zeno by copies. This monumental altarpiece is one of Mantegna's greatest works. It was whilst engaged on it that he was appointed court painter to the Gonzagas in Mantua, in whose service he was to remain comfortably for the rest of his life, eventually rising to the rank of knighthood. Few painters are blessed with such good fortune. Of very humble origin, Mantegna was adopted and tutored by the Paduan Squaccioni, with whom he later severed ties over his marriage to the daughter of his rival, Jacopo Bellini. This marriage made Mantegna a member of the most renowned family of Venetian artists and he was later to have a considerable artistic influence on his brother-in-law, Giovanni Bellini. Mantegna was the first northern Italian painter to combine the new elements of Tuscan and Venetian art with the Gothic style of his native north, and these influences are evident in his work. He was one of the first artists of his time to be directly inspired by the classical relics of Italy and Greece. Indeed, he's been called the antiquarian of the Quattrocento, and the dream of antiquity is his ideal form. His passion for the classical is clear in this altarpiece. It demonstrates the incisive accuracy of his draftsmanship 
with its masterful handling of the rules of perspective, the sculptural modeling of his figures, and the clarity and brilliance of his palette. We know Mantegna to have been a difficult and domineering character, and yet there is a resonant note of humanity and compassion in his work. Where the large panels of this altarpiece give scope for his great craftsmanship, his imagination ranges freely in passionate and poetic expression in the predellas. His paintings stimulated the imagination of his contemporaries, and his engravings spread his influence throughout northern Italy and beyond. Northern European painters, in particular Dürer and Poussin, owed much to Mantegna and discovered Italian antiquity and the Renaissance through him. Indeed, when he died in 1506, Dürer was on his way to visit him. Unquestionably, Mantegna's world of color and composition had a profound and lasting effect on European painting. Dada, Surrealism. The artist, Richard Oelze, called his painting Everyday Torments. But the world it shows has little in common with the one where most of us find the things that annoy us or frighten us. In the distance there seems to be a city. At least there are buildings to be seen where the view is clear. But most of the foreground is taken up by the monstrous growth that dominates the picture. Half plant, half animal, full of half-formed beings whose final shape is unresolved and whose metamorphosis is perhaps unending. One shape attracts our attention. It looks like a human face, but perhaps it's just an empty mask. But it's the nearest we'll come in this world to the world we know. The strangeness keeps us on our toes. We're torn between fascination and fear at what we'll find next. Every inch seems to conceal a creature of some kind, and every creature seems about to turn into something else. With everyday torments like these, who needs problems of a more momentous kind? Some of the creatures in Elsa's picture do remind us of animals. But they're hardly cuddly household pets. They seem to merge with the vegetation around them as if taking root in the undergrowth where they've been lurking for so long. Meanwhile, the forms above, which we have taken for plants, seem to be sprouting ears and opening eyes as we watch. Elsa's picture treads dangerously near the thin line dividing the products of the artistic imagination from the fantasies of the deranged mind. By all accounts, however, Elsa's personality only strayed from the norm in his acute shyness. Born in 1900, he fought in the First World War and then became an art student at the Bauhaus School in Weimar. He had already worked through several styles before finding his own voice in Surrealism. Among the established Surrealists, it was Max Ernst to whom Elsa was closest in technique. He made good use of Ernst's method of frottage, rubbings made from uneven surfaces and used for imaginary landscapes. But whereas Ernst's landscapes often have a fossilized look, Elsa's usually seem preternaturally alive. Everyday Torments was painted in Paris in 1934, and in the same year was included with other works by Elsa in a surrealist exhibition there. Though flattered to be welcomed into this charmed circle, Elsa didn't become closely involved with the surrealist plans and activities.
but he continued to produce surrealist works as striking as Distances and The Haunting Expectation. The power of this picture lies in its combination of the mundane and the extraordinary. But in everyday torments, we are presented with the extraordinary in all its exotic detail and asked to believe in it as unquestioningly as we would in a picture of a Sunday picnic. Elsa said that he wanted to paint fantastical objects, plants and animals as if they were part of the everyday world. He compared what he was aiming at to the images produced by photography, accepted by everyone as records, as documents. Salvador Dali, some of whose surrealist paintings had a similar aim, spoke of hand-painted photographs of the artist's dream. But for Elsa, the dream is a more tangible reality than the real world. It was not, after all, so uncommon a reaction during the troubled times he had lived through, and perhaps there was also an element of premonition. Having left Germany, Elsa was only to find a temporary home in France, Though 1936 saw his work on show in both New York and London, it was also the beginning of a 10-year break in his activity as an artist. Leaving France, he pursued a nomadic and impoverished exile, first in Switzerland, then in Italy. Eventually, he returned to Germany and, for the second time in his life, found himself in the army. In 1946, out of uniform at last, he went to live in the artist's colony at Vorbsveda on the North Sea coast. He found that he had been virtually forgotten by the artistic world. But the break in Elsa's career brought hardly any change in his style. He started work again as if the interval had been a mere day rather than a whole decade. The work Elsa now produced could easily have come from his time in Paris. Related branches from 1951, for example. Or Troglodyte's Wall, painted in 1957. Or Growing Stillness, from 1961, show the same obsessions the same shapes and arrangements of forms, and the same uncanny ability to both intrigue and disturb, as we find in everyday torments. But the sumptuous colour of the earlier work is gone. The unearthly lilac and orange, the acid green and sulphurous yellow have faded to the dull colour of bone and dry soil. And the individual features we can pick out in everyday torments have given way to ectoplasmic or glacial entities in which a thousand faces are engulfed. The work from this period makes little or no attempt to attract us, as everyday torments may be said to, by the variety of creatures it puts before us, by the sheer beauty of its surface, by endless visual puzzles, by combining the charming with the threatening, by enigmas that keep us coming back to look again and again. This self-portrait from the first of Vorbsveda years shows an alarmingly unhappy man. And what of the dark figure who appears at Elz's shoulder? Is this the terrifying gaze that met Elsa's own wherever he looked? That stares at us from eyes without faces in the late works? And mocks us with hollow laughter in faces where eyes and mouths gape in the same cruel mirth? 
and stared at us already in the painting from 1934. Is this the source of the everyday torments that Ilse, however often he shares them with us, can never shake off?